Hey, thanks, thanks Sarah. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for, for being here today. I'm really happy to see so many people here for, for the talk. Um, my name is Ed Herman. I'm the executive director of the museum, and the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology is IU's newest museum, and it's dedicated to telling the stories of what makes us human. And climate change and our reactions to it are one of those stories, um, perhaps one of the most important that needs to be talked about right now. And today's speaker will do just that. Before we turn the floor over to Dr. Browning, I'd like to extend the museum's thanks to Tracy B. and Themester for their support for the talk and for, for Themester. I'd also like to note that when we're discussing land use and environmental histories, that it's important to remember that we're not the original inhabitants of this land, and nor will we be the last. We acknowledge that the museum and the campus are both situated on the traditional homelands of the Miami, the Shawnee, the Potawatomi, and the Delaware, and the museum is committed to collaborating with these and other indigenous partners on the co-creation of knowledge, scholarship, and education, both in the present and into the future. As a university-based museum, we believe strongly that sharing knowledge and research are essential, and that's why we're thrilled to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Brennan Browning. Dr. Browning comes to IU from UC Davis, where she earned her PhD in US history. Um, she has a passion for cross-disciplinary collaboration, particularly environmental issues. She serves as the Midwestern and Indiana Community History Fellow for the Environmental Resilience Institute. Her talk today is entitled Resilience and the Indiana Way using history to understand Hoosier's perspectives on climate change. Welcome, Dr. Browning. Thank you so much, Ed. Thanks for that introduction. Um, and thank you for the land acknowledgement as well. Um, I really appreciate you opening the presentation with that. Um, and I, I really wanna thank you for inviting me to be a part of the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology's fall programming and the College of Arts and Sciences semester events on resilience. It's really an honor to be here with you all. And I wanna thank Sarah Hatcher as well for all of her work organizing the event. So today I'm gonna to be reflecting on resilience through the lens of environmental history. And I'll share some insights that I've gleaned throughout my interdisciplinary research over the past several years regarding the historical contours of Indiana's resilience in the face of climate change impacts. And my hope is that these thoughts might prove helpful in forging a path forward in the midst of our contemporary climate change crisis. So to begin, I just wanna note my disciplinary perspective as an environmental historian with core research interests in environmental justice and environmental health in particular. And I want to give a signpost here of the importance of approaching the extremely wicked socio-ecological problem of climate change from different disciplinary frameworks and integrating these frameworks in order to understand how both the human and natural worlds have dynamically shaped the other at the material, political, and cultural levels. And this is something I've been thinking through a lot um, this semester in particular. Um, I'm co-teaching a class um, a semester class in the Department of Biology with a biologist and an environmental scientist about um, interdisciplinary approaches to socio-ecological problems. So it's something I'm working through with students here um, each day. So I've selected two quotes from environmental humanities scholars and writers to help me explain how I'm approaching the history of climate change. So in the words of writer Amitav Ghosh, quote, the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of imagination. And in Gosha's words here, we get a sense that understanding the roots of what different societies think of as the cultural good life or the kind of ideal lifestyle that should be attained is imperative for discerning what is driving human behavior on the one hand and what kinds of policies can redirect societies toward a more resilient future on the other hand. And discerning the evolution of this ideal of the good life and the practice of the imagining of possible futures is rooted in historical practice. From my perspective, perhaps the most important tool that history can offer us in our debates about climate change is allowing us to discover who has been left out of the dominant narratives about the good life and possible futures. More often than not, we need to be able to read between the lines in order to see who has been left out 
And today I'll be sharing a few stories that will help explain what I mean by that and why it's important for policymakers and community members to read between the lines of history when we're talking about climate resilience planning. Today, I'm also going to look at the climate crisis from the critical lens of environmental racism and how histories of environmental inequalities in Indiana have created the conditions for what environmental humanities scholar Rob Nixon has called slow violence. This is the second quote here. So slow violence occurs through the gradual drawing out of environmental crises, such as climate change, toxic drift, contamination, and deforestation. As the effects of these crises unfold incrementally and often invisibly, they often do not invoke the public scrutiny of the quiet but devastating lethality at play. Of course, the sensational spectacle driven racial violence that has plagued Indiana's history is obviously really important to examine. But what I'm going to do here today is to suggest that it's also essential to try to understand the history behind the slow violence of environmental threats facing frontline marginalized communities. Much of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon has been inspired by a collaborative project from the Environmental Resilience Institute, where I'm a postdoctoral fellow. And uh, this project is called the Hoosier Life Survey. And it was conducted in 2019 uh, to assess Hoosiers' opinions and preparedness regarding environmental change, extreme weather, and other climate-related risks. I was really fortunate to be a part of the research team, which was led by Dr. Eric Sandweiss, who is the Thomas and Catherine Miller Professor of History at IU Bloomington, and Dr. Matt Hauser, the former ERI Fellow in Sociology and now a research fellow at the University of Maryland and the Nature Conservancy. I'll be talking about the survey in greater depth in a moment, but I wanted to mention the survey report as the foundation for my comments here today and acknowledge Matt's and Eric's leadership on this project at the start. So the recently released report from the world's leading climate scientists at the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has shown us that the planet has warmed 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And in the next few decades, we're likely to hit the 1.5 degrees Celsius point that scientists have been warning us about for some time now, as the ceiling that we need to stay below when it comes to global temperature increase in order to avoid the very worst negative impacts of climate change. But the IPCC underscored that it's not a lost cause yet. This, this slide from the IPCC jumped out at me because it reminded me of the very real toll that climate change news has on individuals' mental health, with psychologists and social scientists having studied and documented climate anxiety and ecological grief. Over the course of my public scholarship on Indiana and the Midwest, I found that when climate change news and climate scientist studies become too overwhelming for people to process with any sense of hope, history can provide a constructive lens through which to see how previous generations have risen to environmental challenges and how they fail to do so and, and learn from the mistakes that have been made in the past. So historical thinking, again, encourages the sense of multi-perspectivity and empathy, and it encourages people to imagine multiple futures. These are all crucial to building our social capacity to effectively address climate change. Understanding the cultural popular mythology of the Midwest is important for this project of analyzing how Indiana's history informs contemporary approaches to climate change. The Midwest, as you all know well from living here, has long been symbolized as the heartland of the United States, a quintessentially American place where rural and small town values have long abided and the nation's core identity appears intact and pristine. This is the image that has dominated the popular imagination for over a century. But if we look closer, we can see that this idea of a pristine, isolated heartland is a myth. And historian Kristen Hoganson at the University of Illinois dismantles this myth in her book, The Heartland and American History. Yet even with the understanding that the cultural construct of the Midwestern heartland has never been true in actuality, and that the Midwest has always been deeply interconnected within a global network of other places, it's still crucial to understand that this mythology is very important because it affects how people think about this region and how residents understand their communities and their own identities. One important avenue for contextualizing the heartland mythology is dismantling the often presumed whiteness of Midwestern communities and acknowledging both their diversity as well as the region's long history of racial inequalities. 
When we think back to the most important moments in galvanizing the Black Lives Matter movement, at least four have occurred in Midwestern cities. White police officers killed Michael Brown in Ferguson in 2014, George Floyd in Minneapolis in 2020, Drajan Reed in Indianapolis in 2020, and Jacob Lake in Kenosha in 2020. Non-white Midwesterners experience some of the most profound disparities in terms of socioeconomic well-being and public health in the nation. As historical scholarship on the Great Migration has shown, as the Black population of the Midwest increased dramatically from 1916 to 1970, the millions of African Americans who left the South did not completely escape the legacy of Jim Crow. Racial exclusions lived on in the Midwest through various mechanisms, including exclusive zoning, and race-restrictive deed covenants, which ensured residential segregation. Another important source for contextualizing the enduring legacy of the Midwestern heartland mythology is the famous Middletown sociological studies. And I'll also flag here that the Middletown studies provided inspiration for the Environmental Resilience Institute's Hoosier Life Survey, which I'm going to explain more again in a moment. So first, a little bit of historical background about the Middletown studies. In 1924, sociologists and married couple Robert and Helen Lind selected the gas boom city of Muncie, which is about 50 miles northeast of Indianapolis, to study as representative of the so-called average American small city. In their final writing, they removed any specific references to Muncie because they were trying to convey an anonymous idealized city. The studies examined shifting patterns of behavior, cultural norms, and community organization in modern America from the 1890s through the 1920s, and with a follow-up study through the Great Depression. With six printings in its first year of publication in 1929, Middletown became a bestseller, and it proved an enduring touchstone for the social sciences and the popular imaginings of American culture. This was the first time that an ethnographic study had focused on modern American culture and the American public at the time was really enthralled by it. Um, and they quickly figured out that Middletown was Muncie. The residents of Muncie knew it, um, and it, it quickly became apparent that that was the case. So part of the reason that the Lynn selected Muncie was out of an effort to find a racially homogenous community that would allow the researchers to focus in on the issue of social class rather than racial and ethnic diversity. Their overriding research concern was the development of the American middle class. In fact, the Lynns had first selected South Bend, Indiana, but switched to Muncie because they thought South Bend was too diverse. But it's important to note that the Lynns distorted the demographic data of Muncie itself, largely neglecting the city's growing African American and ethnic immigrant populations. When the Lynns began working in Muncie in 1924, the Ku Klux Klan's power over the Republican Party was at its height. The Klan held large marches in the early 1920s, and in 1924, their march was led by Muncie Mayor John Hampton Sr. and the Muncie Chief of Police. So these stories about discrimination and violence against African Americans are largely absent from Middletown's reports. Their follow-up study did talk about the Klan um, as a type of social organization. Um, but didn't go into detail about the experiences that African Americans had um, uh, and the racial violence that they faced. But the Ball State Center, um, the Ball State University Center for Middletown Studies has worked to document this important missing piece of the Middletown Studies. One key example of the extreme types of violence that Blacks living in and around Muncie faced in the period of the Middletown Studies occurred in 1930 a year after the Lynns published their first volume of findings and had begun to embark on their follow-up study. On August 7, 1930, a white mob lynched two black men named Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith in Marion, Indiana, which is less than 40 miles to the north. The next day, a Muncie African-American mortician, Reverend John E. Johnson, who's pictured here, took the bodies of the murdered young men back to Muncie in order to embalm them in preparation for burial. White supremacists planned to form a mob and take the bodies from Johnson, but Black Munsonians got word of this and kept vigil over Reverend Johnson's chapel so that he could complete his work and return the bodies safely to their families in Marion. These very public acts of racism by the Klan on the one hand and resistance by Reverend Johnson and his supporters on the other hand 
point to the divides that shaped the lived experiences of African Americans in the community. Their lack of mobility and opportunity to live in any neighborhood they might choose or work in any profession or have access to healthcare or other forms of environmental goods like healthy, uncontaminated environments. And I wanted to highlight these points about racial inequality here because they are a reminder of how racism both gets baked into everyday lived experiences for Indiana's African-American population and how it then often went unremarked in the past century's influential social commentary and scholarly analysis. So this is what I mean by the notion of reading between the lines to understand who is being left out of our concept of the idealized good life. And again, this, this story of Middletown um, kind of epitomized the idea of that small, small town, small city, um, United States, and the Lynn's, you know, really consciously pick somewhere in the Midwest, because that's where they saw as, as the heart, the heartland of the United States, and that it would be representative of everywhere else. So this is really telling that this is the story that's been left out. And too often this remains the truth today, right, that the legacies of structural racism continue on unremarked in both our community's very physical infrastructure and our societal infrastructure. One of the leading scholars of Indiana history, Dr. Jim Madison has thoroughly researched this history of racial exclusion and violent discrimination in Indiana, especially through his work on the history of the Klan and lynching. Madison has also provided important insights on the sociopolitical history of the state of Indiana in his comprehensive historical volumes published by Indiana University Press and pictured here. First, The Indiana Way, a state history published in 1986. And second, the updated account of Hoosiers, a new history of Indiana published in 2014. Madison's idea of what he calls the Indiana Way traced the historical roots of a set of social and political behaviors reflective of a favoring of economic growth and development, but pursuing this imperative through a stubborn preference for incremental change over rapid reform and for personal action over communal regulation. Since territorial days, the dominant trend in Hoosier politics and social life has been to approach socio-political challenges not through rapid revolutionary change, but through a cautious preference for gradual evolution and a deep respect for established tradition. In general, Madison argued, past generations of Hoosiers were skeptical of government, protective of individual freedom, and strongly attached to a sense of place. So we can identify three intertwined manifestations of the Indiana Way that are particularly important to the legacy of environmental regulation in the state and for issues of environmental justice. First, an emphasis on individual liberties over pursuing regulation for communal well-being. Second, a tendency for low taxes and a respect for promoting entrepreneurialism. And third, skepticism regarding government intervention and instead a preference for voluntary philanthropy over government aid. For example, Indiana has the most community foundations in the country with one in each of the state's 92 counties thanks to funding from the Lilly Endowment that got them started. Madison recognized that Indiana's two centuries of emphasis on individual freedom and small government have contributed to a reluctance to pursue public health regulations, such as regulating smoking or mandating healthier school cafeteria menus. This legacy of so-called pioneer traditions has also meant that racial and socioeconomic disparities have continued when it comes to important qualifiers for the quality of life, including education, infant mortality, and employment opportunities. The natural environment has also suffered from the Indiana way, as the state was hesitant to direct government power toward regulating air, water, and soil pollution. And this lax approach to environmental regulation has had significant consequences for public health, especially for low-income and BIPOC communities. This image of the Indiana Government Center North in Indianapolis shows the marketing slogan developed by the Indiana Economic Development Commission in 2013. And that slogan is a state that works, which conveys Indiana's business-friendly environment, facilitated by low corporate income tax rates and tax credits, among other incentives. Another component to this business-friendly past and present is a less stringent approach to environmental regulation. Over the past decade, Indiana's investments in environmental protections have fallen significantly. Indiana public media has reported 
that the funding for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources for the 2022 and 2023 fiscal years will be about 3% lower than the current budget. Budgets for, st for state environmental agencies really haven't recovered since the 2008 recession, which has made it difficult for them to retain employees and maintain environmental protections. Indiana has long relied on public private partnerships as a cost saving mechanism when regulating environmental protections, but this has sometimes resulted in policies that safeguard corporate interests and hurt the natural environment and public health. For example, in 2020, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management program overseeing the cleanup of brownfield contaminated sites had only 11 people to manage more than 470 sites. This made it really difficult for the Department of Environmental Management to put pressure on parties responsible for the contamination to pay for the cleanup costs. And because of these low staff numbers, the Department of Environment Environmental Management created a program called the Independent Closure Process in 2012 that allows parties responsible for polluting lower priority sites to do cleanups without direct oversight from the agency. This attrition of environmental protections and enhancement of pro-business policies has contributed to environmental degradation and health problems across the state. Okay, so taking these three threads of the fabric of Indiana history that I've just talked about, the Midwestern heartland mythology, the long history of racial inequalities, and the Indiana Way's limited government and prioritization of business interests, how do these various threads inform Hoosier's experiences of and thoughts about climate change today? So I'm going to return now to the Environmental Resilience Institute's Hoosier Life Survey, which I mentioned a few times now, and you know, asking how are people in Indiana, which we might think about as today's middle towns, how are Hoosiers thinking about environmental change today? The survey had nearly 3,000 responses and represented a cross-section of the state with responses from 90 of Indiana's 92 counties. I'll note here that a key divergence between the Middletown studies and our Hoosier Life Survey was that we deliberately oversampled for members of racial minority groups whose viewpoints might otherwise go underrepresented in a state that includes only 10 counties with a minority population of 15% or greater. All right, so the basics about the survey at one level, the survey's results simply confirmed that although the majority of Hoosiers do think that climate change is happening, a significant portion of the population remains by and large skeptical of the existence of anthropogenic climate change and hesitant about efforts to limit human emissions of greenhouse gases. Of the three quarters of our respondents who believed that the climate is changing, um, who reported believing that the climate is changing, 10%, which is a small but significant fraction, believe that such change is entirely or mostly due to natural and not human causes. And an additional 11% are uncertain what is causing climate change. Hoosier skepticism about the origins of accelerated climate change fits well with their distrust of received expertise, which this showed up again and again in questions about both what is happening in the climate and how to respond to it. This level of mistrust was represented, was represented in survey findings regarding Hoosier's beliefs about the scientific consensus pertaining to climate change scientists. As only 57% of respondents said, that they believed most scientists agree that climate change is happening. Also providing evidence for Hoosier's general skepticism and cautious approach to climate change science is our data on whom Hoosier's trust when it comes to preparing for extreme weather, such as excess heat or flooding. Respondents reported placing a lot of trust in their own judgment in preparing for extreme weather conditions than they did in any other group, including scientists and public officials. You can see here that 55% of respondents said they trusted their own judgment, and the next highest percentage for that high level of trust was nationally or internationally based scientists at 37%, and family, friends, and neighbors at 36%. Respondents registered their highest level of distrust toward local officials and the media. It's really interesting to break this data about trust down by community type. In comparing urban and rural areas, you see that in both areas, in both urban and rural areas, 60% of respondents said that they trusted their own judgment. But then when you compare trust for national or international scientists, 
48% of urban respondents trusted these scientists compared to just 27% of rural respondents. These results suggest that expert-driven outreach might be an effective way to connect urban residents with resilience planning information, but it would be less influential, most likely in rural communities. A more effective way to conduct outreach with residents of rural communities may be to prioritize options that allow rural residents to make up their own minds, such as connecting with local stakeholders or holding community meetings or dialogues. What about respondents' thoughts about how climate change is impacting them? And most important for my research interest on environmental justice, how did the variables of race and economic status map onto these answers? I should note here that a majority of Hoosiers think climate change is harming people in the United States right now, and 69% believe climate change will hurt people in Indiana either a great deal or a moderate amount. Social scientific research has long shown us that lower income households and communities of color face higher environmental risks from pollution and toxins. And these disproportionate burdens are also felt when it comes to climate change impacts, including extreme weather events such as heat waves and flooding, because these populations do not have the resources to adapt their homes to mitigate these risks. Perhaps it's not surprising then that our survey data showed that lower income Hoosier households are more likely to believe that climate change will harm them personally a great deal compared to higher income households. And you can see here that the lower income households reported 21% um, believed that climate change would personally harm them a great deal compared to the, the highest income bracket was set at 10% saying they believed climate change would harm them a great deal. And you can see um, at the top here um, that respondents of color were more likely than white respondents to report that climate change will harm them personally a great deal and that climate change is harming people in the United States right now. These signs of higher concern about climate change also extended to questions about whether climate change is happening. Shown here at the bottom, 76% um, of Black Hoosiers and 86% of non-Black people of color agree that climate change is happening compared to 72% of white Hoosiers. And survey responses about policies to mitigate climate change impacts reveal similar patterns. For example, African-American Hoosiers are more likely to live in urban heat islands and thus have a more difficult time escaping extreme heat. In the survey, Black respondents were about twice as likely as white respondents to support measures that would reduce heat wave risks including public funding for air conditioning, health services, and text-based early warning systems during heat events. This diagram um, from the Indiana Climate Change Impacts Assessment from the Purdue Climate Change Research Center provides a really helpful overview of the types of health threats that climate change presents through weather extremes, rising sea levels, and rising temperatures. And again, public health experts, social scientists, environmental justice scholars have all shown that low-income BIPOC communities bear the brunt of these human health impacts more than other communities because of a lack of socioeconomic resources and social safety nets. These are all factors related to the long history of racial discrimination and limited government protections in the state of Indiana and the United States. How are Indiana residents thinking about tackling climate change? What are they actually doing right now and what do they hope to do? Hoosiers tended to believe themselves capable of managing whatever bad things might follow from climate change. Fewer than one third of our respondents agreed with the blanket statement that advances in science and technology will solve almost every problem that humans face. While more than half agreed that the risks of extreme weather could be lessened by simple things we do at home, which you can see here on this graph, some of the higher um, percentages of what household practices Hoosiers are currently using or interested in, uh, the improved insulation here at the bottom at 70% currently using shade trees to cool my home in summer at 65%. So these are some of the common things um, that Hoosiers are doing. Um, nearly half of respondents said that they would support a statewide income tax increase of up to 1% to fund programs that mitigate climate risks. And well over half reported that they would favor such a tax if it were levied specifically on corporations in proportion to the degree to which they are responsible for emissions pollution, for the emissions of pollution. 
Yet despite these signs of statewide support, we found that only 7% of Hoosiers felt that most of their fellow community members would be likely to support such a tax. And half reported that they don't know how their community feels about these taxes. The vast majority of respondents also felt that the number of their community members supportive of these taxes was not likely to change in the future. So the takeaway here is that the data suggests many in Indiana are not discussing these issues with their neighbors, and thus many are underestimating broader community support for such measures. I want to note one final survey question as we think about how Hoosiers will put their shared past to use in face of uh, in facing an unprecedented future. Near the end of our survey form, we added one entirely open-ended question: what words or phrases best describe who you are? And we had a few selected examples, um, including hardworking and pessimistic, which clearly influenced people's responses. More than one third of all respondents describe themselves as hardworking, while the next most frequent reply was optimistic, which outnumbered pessimistic by a factor of nearly six to one. Um, caring, honest, and realistic all ranked highly among our respondents' answers. While references to such social markers as education and political belief appeared only rarely. So in other words, Hoosiers laid aside the traditional categories by which politicians, the popular media, and yes, historians and social scientists typically categorize them. So I think this should give us hope that Hoosiers consider themselves optimistic, caring, and hardworking. And these are clearly all characteristics that will help us build resilience as we prepare for future challenges. And I, I wanted to note that um, in the question to answer, I'd be happy to talk about a follow-up Hoosier Life study, the Hoosier Life Survey 2.0, um, that our research team conducted um, in the face of all the challenges that 2020 brought about. So um, the pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and climate change, taking all these um, major societal challenges into account. Um, and we uh, resurveyed um, our uh, the individuals that we had reached out to for the first survey. So I would like to talk a little bit about that later if there's time, um, some interesting findings about that. So this note of optimism that I ended on here with the ways that Hoosiers are thinking about themselves as optimistic, realistic, and you know capable of um, facing these challenges that we have before us, um, you know, th this is an optimistic moment to think about, but I also want to call attention to what I believe is the most important challenge in working toward a mo more resilient future. And that is paying close attention to the legacies of environmental racism and how these legacies will worsen with the projected impacts of climate change. So I'd like to offer one case study that will help us be mindful of the ways in which the gradual unfolding of slow violence to relate back to the words of Rob Nixon that I mentioned at the start, how slow violence from historical practices resulting in environmental contamination and segregation make it particularly difficult for low-income BIPOC communities to prepare for environmental change. And again, this issue can sometimes require us to read between the lines of our standard historical narratives to appreciate the roots of climate vulnerabilities. So this story takes us to East Chicago Indiana in Lake County in Northwest Indiana. And this is part of the heavily industrial Calumet region near Chicago. And I found in my research on um, East Chicago, which I just published in the journal Environmental History this month, that we should be attuned to the surprising ways in which this slow violence affects different people differently. In the case of my research, I was focused on how the fallout from environmental contamination and environmental change has affected low-income black and brown women in particular. In some ways, East Chicago's history represents a microcosm of the more recent Indiana economic slogan that I mentioned earlier of a state that works. These maps from the 1920s and 1950s demonstrate the spatial networks that tied Indiana into the modern American capitalist system. But for East Chicago residents, this did not uniformly mean unqualified progress and economic benefit. Many non-white communities in the city are in the shadow of major industrial plants or exist on the footprint of former industries, which has led to significant public health problems. Lead contamination has especially been problematic in East Chicago. In the summer of 2016, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Housing and Urban Development cooperated to expedite the evacuation of 
approximately 1,100 residents, including 680 children from the West Calumet housing complex in East Chicago. Mayor Anthony Copeland informed residents of the 346 unit public housing complex in July that they were at elevated risk of lead poisoning due to the housing's location on the grounds of a former longstanding lead smelter. This story highlights the ways in which climate change has the potential to amplify the significant legacies of environmental racism. The debates that ensued between policymakers and advocacy groups over cleaning up the area's contamination is particularly enlightening for how climate change is exacerbating the environmental risks stemming from past histories of environmental racism. The EPA's initial plan was to clean up just the top two feet of contaminated soil in what had been designated as the USS-led Superfund site. But residents and advocates noted that the remaining contamination from below two feet would continue to present hazards to future generations due to the ecosystem dynamics of flooding and erosion that is projected to worsen with climate changes rising sea levels, as the Superfund site has hydraulic linkages to the Indiana Harbor Shipping Canal, the Grand Calumet River, and the Lake Michigan watershed. While residents initially anticipated a temporary relocation during the remediation process, EPA ultimately determined that the safest course of action was to demolish the housing complex, which the city completed in August 2018, uprooting the entire community. So in order to understand this recent unjust erasure of the West Calumet housing complex community and displacement of hundreds of families, we have to first understand how a public housing complex could come to be built on a site that was contaminated with lead and arsenic. Underlying the West Calumet lead crisis were intertwined mechanisms of state negligence that carried a gendered valence. In particular, policymakers relied on poor and working class women's reproductive labor to safeguard children from the chemical body burdens resulting from industrial contamination. Akeisha Daniels was one of the last residents to leave the complex. Daniels' five children struggled with a series of health problems, including ear and throat infections, scarlet fever, upper respiratory problems, ADHD, and severe stomach cramps. She reported that when she first raised concerns about her children's symptoms with the East Chicago Housing Authority, soon after moving in in the early 2000s, a housing representative informed her that in order to alleviate her children's symptoms, she simply needed to clean her home more thoroughly. This is representative, I would argue, of public officials' sense when it comes to environmental health threats, that the reproductive labor of maternal caretakers is the presumed primary foundation for safeguarding children's health and therefore becomes a mechanism for deflecting state responsibility. And this comes up again and again in the stories about lead poisoning, um, not just in East Chicago, but across the nation. And we can trace the history of East Chicago's lead contamination crisis in public housing and the associated disproportionate caretaking burdens placed on black and brown women back to the moment of mid 20th century urban renewal in the Calumet region. In East Chicago, disparities between whites and non-whites in the urban renewal process were reinforced by a coalition of university, government, and business actors. Founded in 1954, the Purdue Calumet Development Foundation was a nonprofit organization focused on improving housing and living conditions in the Calumet area and served as staff for East Chicago's Redevelopment Commission. Although the foundation functioned as a nonprofit, non political organization, it preserved the power of commerce and industry while operating as a university community coalition for regional development. You can see on this map um, the sponsor members of the foundation. And these were the major industrial corporate players in the region, including Inland Steel, Standard Oil, DuPont, and others. And you can also see um, as shaded areas, the two urban renewal projects in East Chicago, um, the, the Indiana Harbor Urban Renewal Project Number 1 on the Northeast side, and the West Calumet Urban Renewal Project Number 2 toward the South, with the second project serving as the prime relocation area for residents dislocated by the first project. Non-white community members expressed a significant degree of mistrust regarding the urban renewal process at the time. Editors from one of the leading newspapers of the region, the Latin Times, urged readers to ask their city council members why the mayor was discriminating against Latinx and African-American residents in the harbor 
and why he was not mandating the tearing down of the homes of white residents. So the West Calumet housing complex emerged in this moment of urban renewal with officials citing the complex directly on the footprint of the former smelter at the Anaconda led an international refining company. The complex was built at a time when public health and environmental scientists had begun voicing concerns over lead's impact on public health, particularly in studies regarding leaded gasoline's impact on pediatric health. But housing officials continued to consider the site a viable place for public housing with the excuse that there were simply no other areas to build because of the prevalence of industry in the region. It's interesting to see how women's reproductive labor was critical um, for fulfilling the Purdue Calumet Development Foundation's goals of urban renewal. In its recommendation um, flyers sent out to families, the foundation commanded um, properly maintaining and keeping clean their own homes and properties, instilling their children, their children with pride in their homes and their neighborhoods, um, and with respect for property, both theirs and their neighbors, and joining and working with groups promoting community betterment, such as cleanup organizations. So as you can see here, traditional norms of heteropatriarchal femininity and domesticity filtered throughout the foundation's dedicated protocol with an emphasis on cleanliness, nurturing children, and fostering neighborly collaboration. And I should note the foundation's rhetoric echoed the gendered language employed by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development's precursor, the, <clears throat> pardon me, the Housing and Home Finance Agency. This cartoon image was part of the 1956 publication by the Urban Renewal Administration Commissioner, James Fallon, who used these gendered metaphors of cleaning house. Uh, you can see here the gargantuan broom of code enforcement, coupled with the depiction of an orphan girl. This really conjured notions of re maternal responsibility and mother centrality to stitching together community relations. So there's this deeply gendered history to the urban renewal process that you know, is not very apparent at first glance. You kind of have to read between the lines to see some of these dynamics. And this gendered history has carried forward in the lead poisoning crisis at West Calumet's Superfund site today. So similar to what environmental justice scholar Julie Z has explained about the history of asthma in the United States, the history of lead poisoning reveals that it is a racialized and gendered disease. As a chronic condition, the adverse effects of elevated blood lead levels means that caretakers and maternal figures in particular are tasked with management of children's symptoms and controlling primary exposures in their domestic environment. Elevated blood lead levels are especially high among lower income and minority children who have higher rates of lead exposure in their lived environments. Maternal control over children's exposure begins during pregnancy when lead stored in a mother's bones can be remobilized and transferred to the fetus. And maternal control continues in the months of infancy when lead transfers from mother to child through nursing. Narratives of environmentalism, precautionary consumption, and feminism are intertwined in the biopolitics of managing lead contamination. So the West Calumet story and its ties to urban renewal's earlier dislocations underscores the need for government agencies to prioritize community engagement in identifying and remediating environmental health risks in a changing climate. Furthermore, this history highlights the discriminatory roots of government agencies past sightings of subsidized housing in segregated and environmentally hazardous areas, which is ultimately akin to other manifestations of environmental racism experienced by non-white communities in Indiana that will only worsen or become amplified through the additional pressures of climate change impacts. In the wake of East Chicago's lead poisoning crisis, EPA and HUD found that 70% of Superfund sites sit within one mile of a public housing or HUD multifamily housing complex. For decades to come, public housing communities across the United States will continue to experience toxic exposures and the trauma of, violent rupture, of the violent rupture of social networks from the legacies of this institutionalized racism. So to bring us back to the question of resilience, let me conclude by emphasizing that as Hoosiers move forward to address the legacies of climate change in our social and natural environments, it's especially important to prioritize the question of resilience for whom, and to read between the lines of our historical narratives and keep this history of the Indiana way and racial inequality in particular at the forefront of our minds. And with that, I'd welcome any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Browning. That was wonderful. Um, we are going to take questions and you are welcome to go ahead and put those into the chat.
And we do have one to kick us off here. And it is, how do you see the Indiana way of localism slash distrust of change interacting with the indigenous settler histories in the Indiana area? Are there instances you know of in contemporary Indiana, oh, need to scroll a little farther, where there is momentum towards something like indigenous reconciliation or decolonization? That's an excellent question. Um, thank you for that. I, you know, looking at Jim Madison's work, he does, he traces back to that history of um, the violent removal of indigenous peoples here in Indiana. And um, it, I've not thought about the contemporary implications of that, of um, that's something I'll have to think through a little bit more, but definitely um, this sense of, um, of, you know, quote unquote, improving the land um, within the spirit of the American capitalist system um, and making the land um, part of that system. I think um, there's not room for indigenous voices in that. And I, um, I think that's something that we need to be attuned to that the Indiana way has um, closed out opportunities for um, visions of, of how indigenous people are still a part of this state um, and envisions for um, how they can be part moving forward in a more integrated way. So um, definitely an important question to think through more. So another question is, um, with thanks for a wonderful talk, wondering how much of this is the Indiana way versus a rural American way more broadly. And that echoes the question I would have asked. Excellent, yes. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, so much of Indiana's history is tied to a rural history. Um, and I've struggled with that question in terms of how distinct is uh, the Indiana way compared to this kind of putting that against the heartland mythology that we talked about at the Midwest. Um, there's definitely overlap, right, between uh, Indiana is, is part of this region. And um, I think it's helpful to kind of uh, hone in on Indiana specifically so that we can understand um, the evolution of our socio-political uh, climate, but it, it's also important to situate it within the Midwest. So I, you know, I would say Indiana, I, you know, began my work as an urban environmental historian. So thinking about Indiana as a state um, known for its small cities in particular and small and, and towns. Um, so I, I don't see Indiana as purely a rural um, place per se, but I think it's, it's also tied into this Midwestern kind of agricultural rural um, vision that people tend to, to assume. So um, yes and no on that, that question, Susanna, yeah. So, and kind of building off of that, I'm wondering as the United States becomes increasingly mobile, do you think that the Indiana way will continue to hold such sway over state and local politics? No, I think I think it's definitely breaking down. That's that's a great question. And um, Madison, you know, talks about how it's evolved um, away from such a stringent, you know, um, the way that I presented it in kind of those categorical terms. Um, it's more fluid than that, definitely. Um, but I think, you know, Hoosiers do have this kind of sense of place and respect for for Indiana history, and I in my kind of public history engagements, um, see this real passion for this local history and, and state history. Um, and I don't think that's entirely unique to Indiana, but um, when we engage with these questions and have these public conversations, it's important to know that people are approaching um, these conversations with that deep respect for, um, for the state and, and its history. Thank you. We do still have a few more minutes if anyone else would like to jump in with a question or two. 
And I, I can talk a little bit about that follow-up survey, um, the Hoosier Life Survey 2.0. I, it's interesting um, to see kind of what effect the pandemic has had on um, people's thoughts about climate change. You know, social scientific literature, uh, you know, seem to say that um, with the extra stressors presented by the pandemic, that perhaps people would become less concerned about climate change. Um, and that there's this notion of this finite pool of worry that uh, we saw with the Great Recession in 2008, that people really just had too much going on to think about climate change. And so there was this uh, lack of concern comparatively about climate change at that time. But our survey showed that, in fact, people um, became more concerned about climate change over that time. Um, and perhaps there's this kind of snowball effect that um, scientific uh, discourse about the pandemic um, then informed people's thinking about, um, you know, how scientists are approaching climate change and gave people more trust in scientific literature in that way. So there was, um, I think it was 5% increase in Hoosiers who believe that climate change is happening and a 5% increase in the percentage who reported that, you know, believing that humans are the primary causes of this change. So that was really significant. And then we broke that down by um, political party, and it was actually Republicans more than independents or Democrats who were responsible for that increase. Um, so I think the sense of vulnerability in the moment of the pandemic really shaped people's thinking about climate change. Um, that was a really interesting finding that we had that I wanted to note. <laughs> and are there plans for a survey 3.0? Not at this time, but I'm sure, you know, it's been really exciting to see um, this is the first kind of survey of its kind that, um, you know, so many of the surveys are nationwide, but having this really detailed understanding at the state level is really, really important and unique. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I am most appreciative of you sharing all of this with us. And I'd like to echo what Dr. Ketterson put in the chat um, and say thank you for a wonderful set of insights into Hoosiers, their history, and how it's impacting how they view climate change, which is definitely something we need to be thinking about more diligently and more often. Yes. So thank, thank you so much, Sarah. Much. Thanks for having me. It was great to, to join you all. And for those of you who are interested in more programs by the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, please follow us on social media or check out our website for upcoming events. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thanks.